and participants. Hey everybody. Oh, joining in Hey, uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. I teach class just before this at the other side of campus, and so I will be late every um, seminar. Um, we tend to give it a minute for people to arrive and get started. People are rolling in. Um, I think we'll have Alice in two weeks. Um, Bob, are you using just the one computer that I see you on there, or do you need to get a different one on? Do I need to give you I'm on my laptop any permissions? Laptop. Are you good? Oh, you're I'm muted, or stuff. I am not hearing. Oh. Uh, Let me see. Audio uh, settings. Uh, I'm uh, not muted. I had trouble with this uh, one time recently. Ah, now I, I hear. Okay. Uh, you, so are we good now? I think are you gonna share are you gonna share a screen? screen share? Uh yeah, let's see. Um uh, share. All right, you seeing my screen now? That's looking quite promising. I will open up the chat and I will turn off my video. People don't need to see me. And we are very pleased to have Bob Gump talk to us today. And I will let him take it away without further ado. Well, one further ado. Bob, maybe you could um, um, make your the PDF full screen because we're getting some background stuff too. Um, let's see. Oh, well, there's a little, you read about the stuff down here. Well, I mean, it just it's easier to read. Anyway, however you like, whatever. Uh, okay, because, yeah, I'm not sure what to... Under Usually under window, it says, is like on the PDF itself. Oh, well, I see. I could make that full screen. Not uh, that. Yeah. Well, that wasn't it. Is anyway, it, is that we I'm, to... I'm, not a, I'm not a Windows guy, so you'll have to figure it out. All right. Well, I'm not a Windows guy either, really. I mean, I use it, but... I'm not a tech person. It's All usually right. under, it, it, there's a thing you see in the upper left that says window. Uh, no, I, anyway, I'm, yeah. You go on. I don't know. Uh, maybe I should just go on then. And yeah. Is that uh, okay? You're, you're yeah. seeing most of the screen should be filled up by uh, my PDF file that says transverse story on angle manifolds. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, okay. Yep. All right, so uh, I'll get started then. Um, so throughout the talk, I'm going to assume everything is oriented and in fact, compatibly without uh, specifying exactly what that means. Uh, if things are non-orientable, life gets a lot more complicated. So uh, let me start with something that probably everybody here is familiar with already, namely contact structures. And uh, just to uh, set the stage, of course, those are hyperplane fields, C, in odd dimensional manifolds that are characterized by being maximally non integrable. So, what does that mean? Well, we can write any hyperplane field as the kernel of a one form. And uh, so, the, the maximal non integrability condition just says that if we take D of this one form, and restrict to the contact hyperplanes, it's a non-degenerate skew symmetric form. And uh, by basic by basic differential geometry, D alpha restricted to vector fields in C is just minus alpha evaluated on the lead bracket of the vector fields. So that's another way of thinking about non-degeneracy. This is really, really uh, picking off the uh, component of the bracket that is not in C. 
And uh, so the integrable case of, of foliations, of course, those are closed under Lee bracket, which is just the same as saying this thing is zero and non-degeneracy is sort of the opposite extreme from that. So in the uh, three-dimensional case that I really want to focus on, uh, C is a two-plane field, and so D alpha being non-degenerate is the same as it being non-zero. And uh, in Lee bracket terms, that's equivalent to saying that we can get the entire tangent bundle of the three-manifold by bracketing vector fields in C. All right. Uh, now there's some, there are two very fundamental properties of, uh, of uh, the set of contact structures. First of all, the contact structures are all locally the same. Uh, any two points in contact N manifolds have contact amorphic neighborhoods so that all geometry or topology and, and the contact setting is global somehow. Uh, well, that's also true for foliations, for example. But what's different about contact manifolds is the contact condition is open. If we wiggle a contact hyperplane field a little bit, it's still going to be a contact hyperplane field. And so now these two conditions are, <clears throat> are so fundamental <clears throat> that it's reasonable to ask, <clears throat> given for any K and N, if you look at the space of all K-plane distributions on an N-dimensional manifold, uh, under what conditions can you get an open set of things that are all the same locally like this? <clears throat> if we look at that question, we find that the contact structures, the, the set of contact structures is part of a much larger family of what are called topologically stable distributions that satisfies these two conditions. And those were in fact classified by Cartan in 1901. And uh, of course, there's one other obvious example, namely line fields of any dimension are all the same locally, of course, and well, the set of all line fields is opened in itself. So sort of trivially, those are topologically stable. And uh, those, of course, are well studied. That's basically the subject of uh, dynamical systems, which is a whole different direction from where I want to go today. But uh, it's an important class of distributions. But let's instead uh, look at higher dimensional <clears throat> distributions. And uh, so the first thing we notice is that contact planes live on odd dimensional manifolds. And we might ask, uh, what can we say analogously in even dimensional manifolds? And then we get what are called even contact structures. So an even contact structure is basically a hyperplane field uh, in an even dimensional manifold. And now we can no longer ask for it to be non-degenerate because now the the uh, hyperplanes are odd dimensional, so you, you can't have a non-degenerate skew-symmetric form. So instead, we just ask for D alpha restricted to C to be maximal rank. And so what that means here is that, um, <clears throat> well, for an odd dimensional space, we're going to have to have a one dimensional kernel in the space. And so this is gonna be a, a canonical kernel with the property that when we mod out by that kernel to get an even dimensional space, then D alpha is defined as non-degenerate. So that's what it means to have an even contact structure. And in particular, in dimension four that I want to focus on, uh, well, once again, when we look at E mod W, that's two dimensional in this case. So asking for non-degeneracy is the same as asking for D alpha on E to be non-zero, nowhere zero. And by the same reasoning as before, if we phrase that in terms of Lie brackets, it says that we can get the entire tangent bundle of the four manifold by bracketing things in E. So, uh, all right, there's a, a very useful uh, observation we can make here comparing this condition against 
the corresponding contact condition, or we can do a similar thing in any number of dimensions. And what we see is that anytime we have a hypersurface that's transverse to this line field W, uh, that, <clears throat> that automatically inherits a contact structure. We just, uh, we get the uh, tangent spaces of the hypersurface by modding out W from the ambient tangent spaces. And so that turns our, um, our uh, even contact structure into a contact structure on the hypersurface. And that is very fundamental because of the way it's constructed. It's automatically preserved by any flow that's tangent to W. That is, when we flow this, this hypersurface, it's flowing through contact amorphisms. All right. So why is it that most of us maybe haven't heard of even contact structures before? Well, it turns out that they have been classified up to homotopy by McDuff, and it turns out they satisfy what's called the H principle. That is, that uh, if we want to classify up to homotopy through even contact structures, that's really the same thing as classifying the underlying hyperplane fields together with some homotopy theoretic data. So once we solve the homotopy theoretic data, then we're done. Uh, so uh, uh, these things have been deemed non-interesting compared to uh, contact structures because at least the homotopy classification is, is some sense, in some sense trivial. If we compare with contact structures, of course, on a closed manifold, the overtwisted contact structures also satisfy this H principle and hence are deemed not terribly interesting. But what makes contact structures interesting is that in addition to the overtwisted ones, there are these tight contact structures. And uh, those occur sporadically and are very delicately related to the underlying topology of the manifold. And uh, so those are very interesting precisely because they're they're not just a purely homotopy theoretic thing with, with uh, dressed up in, in sort of a differential geometric form like, uh, like the overtwisted ones or like the uh, even contact structures. So one way of thinking of McDuff's theorem is that there's no such thing as, in, as a tight even contact structure. So uh, that's sort of, we're now at the end of the discussion of those. And uh, so to sum up then, we're looking at all the different kinds of topologically stable distributions. We've got line fields, and then we've got contact and even contact structures depending on the parity of the dimension. And those fill up the whole family. Well, except like uh, a lot of families, there's this one crazy uncle that no one really understands. And that's the angle structures. So what is an angle structure then? Well, so what's going on here is that, is that if you want to get an open condition, then you need enough diffeomorphisms to take one of these things locally and fill up a whole open set by, by applying diffeomorphisms. And the diffeomorphisms really are, a diffeomorphism locally is just a collection of n functions, whereas the plane fields are sort of a quadratic thing. So in order to, uh, in order to have any chance of having topologically stable distributions, there's this quadratic inequality that needs to be satisfied that basically says that the dimension and co-dimension have to be small in some sense. So either the dimension is one, in the case of um, line fields, or the co-dimension is one. That's the two cases we talked about. And then there's this one other case that squeaks through where the dimension and the co-dimension are both two. So these are what are called angle plane fields, and they only exist on four manifolds, which should make those of us in four-dimensional topology uh, get very interested. Uh, so what are these things? Well, we again want something maximally non-integrable. So like the previous cases, we want to sort of maximize what we can get out of Lie bracketing vector fields in D, the most we can get is something three-dimensional, so we require it to be exactly three-dimensional. And then in order to be sort of maximally generic, we also require the three-plane bundle that we get 
to be an even contact structure. So those two conditions together characterize angle structures. And they're the last member of this family of topologically stable distributions. So what does this give us all together? Well, we, we start out with our two-plane field D that hands us an even contact structure, which is a three-plane field. That even contact structure then has a canonical line field in it. And it's not hard to deduce from what I've already said that that line field has to sit inside of the two-plane field. So we get a complete flag, which, well, given uh, the orientability condition I've imposed, that essentially trivializes the tangent bundle of the manifold. Uh, well, now, what makes these kind of intriguing at this point is it's still not known whether the H principle applies to closed angle manifolds. So we, we don't know whether there's such a thing as a tight angle structure. Uh, now, there is a, a notion of an over-twisted angle structure and also a notion of a loose angle structure. Those do obey the uh, H principle, but it's, uh, it's not really clear uh, how they're related to each other or whether there's anything other than those. So it's still a very interesting open question whether there's anything like a tight angle structure. And so maybe this whole subject is hanging on the answer to that question at this point. Uh, <clears throat> but let's at least assume that these might be interesting for four manifold theory and uh, <clears throat> forge ahead. And of course I should show you some examples. And there's one main example that uh, should seem kind of familiar to anyone who has thought about the uh, cotangent circle bundle to a surface and its canonical contact structure. There's a very similar construction. It's called the prolongation of the contact three manifold. I believe it's due to Cartan. And so what we do is take a, a completely arbitrary contact three manifold, closed or open, it doesn't matter. And then to get the prolongation, first we need a four manifold. And the way we get that is we think of the plane bundle as being a, an abstract vector bundle over N. And we look at the circle bundle inside of that, which is a four manifold. And then there's this canonical angle structure on it, where not surprisingly, the line field W is just the, the tangents to the fibers. Now, what is D? That's a little more, well, you just have to think a little more deeply. That's the part that looks like cotangent bundles. Uh, namely, what is a point in the prolongation? Well, it's essentially a point in N together with a point in the, the corresponding circle, or if you like, a direction or a line, a directed line through the origin. And so we can take that directed line through the origin and direct sum it with the, the uh, tangent of the fiber, that's W. That gives us a two-plane that projects down onto the line that we used to, uh, to define the point in the first place. And uh, so then that gives us a line field in the contact plane field C, or equivalently, it gives us a two-plane field in the in the um, in the angle man uh, that, that determines an angle manifold, and uh, well, to, to visualize that, we just imagine that if we walk around the circle direction, then this line rotates once inside of the contact plane. So these these things are uh, easier to visualize than you might think once you get used to them. So, um, oh, and the um, what is the uh, even contact structure, well, we uh, take the plane field and we sum it with W in the same way, and that gives us the even contact structure. Right? So, um, all right, what, is, what does that mean in practice if we're thinking about visualizing these things? Well, first of all, what is a section of this bundle that forms the prolongation. Well, a section is just a choice of a, a point in the fiber 
everywhere over over each uh, point in the manifold. Well, a point in the fiber is just the same as, a, as an oriented line at the point downstairs. And so sections of the bundle are just the same as line fields in C, which of course is something that all of us should be able to visualize pretty well. And uh, well, we can, we can uh, uh, more generally say that if we have a, uh, a W transverse three manifold in any angle manifold, well, of course, it inherits a contact structure and therefore there's a, an associated prolongation. And well, because it's sitting inside of the angle manifold, the two plane field D is going to determine a line field on, in the contact plane field in the three manifold. And that line field in turn is a section of the prolongation of N. So somehow we can we can think of a, any W transverse three manifold and an angle manifold as being a section in the prolongation in that same three manifold, which again is a line field in the uh, contact plane field. So again, it's a very geometric visualizable sort of thing. And if we want a whole neighborhood of this thing in W, well, the way we move in the W direction is just by rotating the lines. So in fact, we can see a whole neighborhood and that's being identified with a neighborhood in the prolongation of N. All right, so uh, as I've already discussed, angle manifolds are all the same locally. So what that says in fact, is that if we wanna understand an angle manifold locally, then in fact, it's enough to understand the prolongation of R3. And so the uh, we just take R3 with its usual tight contact structure that I've written as dz plus x dy so that we can see the front projections easily. And uh, so then alpha in R3 is cutting out the contact planes, but if we look at the prolongation of R3, that same alpha thought of on the four manifold is cutting out the even contact structure. So we're seeing both of those with the same alpha. So then how do we cut out the two plane field D? Well, we need to do that by uh, intersecting with the kernel of another one form. And that one form, well, I've drawn it here, written it here, it's just uh, sort of what you expect. W is the, little w is the is the fiber coordinate, and this thing rotates once as we go around the fiber as it's supposed to. So uh, we can write d as the intersection of, of uh, two, uh, two uh, one forms. And it's useful to notice that in fact, well, of course, if we take w to be constant, then we've gotten back our contact form alpha. But also if we take z to be constant, then beta is also a contact form in WXY space. So somehow both of these things are contact forms seen in different directions. Now, beta is not canonical the way alpha is being determined up to scale by the even contact structure, but it's there nonetheless. We can choose our local coordinates and then choose a beta that, that has this property. Right. Uh, so if we're interested in things like whether we can <clears throat> whether we can distinguish tight angle structures or anything like that, we can work by analogy with contact three manifolds. And uh, one very useful thing that we find in contact three manifolds is uh, transverse knots. And of course, any knot in a contact three manifold can be made transverse by a C0 a small isotopy. And uh, so we make it transverse to the contact planes. And furthermore, if the uh, knot happens to be null homologous, then we can define what's called the self-linking number. It's an integer. It's somehow the unique formal invariant associated to this knot. And uh, that will then distinguish infinitely many transverse isotopy classes of transverse knots. That is, 
we want to think of two transverse knots as being equivalent if we can isotope from one to the other through transverse knots. And uh, this linking number is an obstruction to being able to do that. Well, so then, uh, of course, transverse knots are, uh, well, one of their many uh, points of interest is that we can use them to characterize which contact structures are tight and which are over twisted. So uh, that suggests that we should try to play the same sort of game with angle manifolds, only now to get something transverse to the angle planes. We don't want to be working with knots anymore. We want to be working with surfaces. So uh, this question was asked by Eli Ashberg at, a, at an AIM conference that uh, was really aimed at trying to uh, blow open the, the, the field of angle manifolds with a lot of uh, brainstorming and stuff. And his question was basically, what can you say about making closed surfaces transverse to an angle distribution? And uh, so there was not much known at the time. There were some families of examples various ways of constructing families of, of examples of transverse surfaces. And there was also uh, another fairly simple observation that was known at the time. And that is that uh, if you have a closed surface that's transverse to the angle plane field, it has to be a torus with the trivial normal bond. The reason for that is that um, the uh, both the tangent and normal bundle are going to be trivialized by the angle structure. So the normal bundle, for example, can be identified with a D along the surface, and D is trivialized by having the line bundle W inside of it. And similarly, the tangent bundle is gotten by modding out D, and that is then trivialized by E, uh, which is going to collapse down to a line bundle in this plane bundle. So, uh, so again, both the tangent and normal bundle are trivial and, and uh, that gives this easy observation. So we have necessary conditions for something to be a uh, transverse surface. But then uh, the main theorem I wanna talk about today is that in fact, those conditions are also sufficient. That is, every torus with a trivial normal bundle is in fact C0 small isotopic to a transverse torus. So uh, precisely analogous to what we can do with knots and contact three manifolds, always making those transverse. But then that raises the question, uh, if you can make, once we know we can make the thing transverse, how many different things can we get that way? And so just like uh, just like the, the linking number distinguishes infinitely many transverse isotopies in the three-dimensional case, we could ask the same question about transverse tori. And then uh, we have this theorem that uh, in fact, well, this is, again, analogous to what we have for um, for um, knots, that if we have a transverse knot that's null homologous, then the self-linking number is defined. Well, similarly, if a torus is trivial in the two homology of an angle manifold, then in fact, we can isotopically realize infinitely many transverse isotopy classes. And they're going to be distinguished by some formal invariant. Uh, what if it's not null homologous? Well, then the same statement holds sort of locally in a, in a neighborhood. And uh, again, that's the same thing you can do with the uh, self-linking number that you can think of as being a relative invariant in, 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 in the three-dimensional case. So, so far what we're seeing is that, is that uh, the final answer is about uh, transverse tori and angle manifolds are precisely analogous to what we're seeing for transverse knots in 
contact manifolds. So now I want to uh, talk about part B of the theorem, which has no analog in dimension three. It's a very different sort of thing. And for that, we could ask, uh, suppose our equivalence relation is no longer transverse isotopy, but transverse homotopy. That is, we're asking if there is a regular homotopy between our two tori that, uh, that uh, is through uh, immersed transverse tori. And so if we ask the same question for knots in, in uh, contact three manifolds, there's nothing interesting there because homotopy implies transverse homotopy. But it turns out that, oops, it turns out that in fact, um, well, this is not as general a statement, but there are a lot of prolongations that uh, have the property that already, if we look at if we look at uh, unknotted tori, we can use unknotted tori to realize, in fact, infinitely many transverse regular homotopy classes, each of which realizes infinitely many transverse isotopy classes. Of course, we can do that with a lot of other knot types of tori as well, but I think it's interesting that already the unknotted case is giving us all this stuff that we don't actually see in dimension three. So, so somehow, in some ways, transverse tori are analogous to transverse knots, but in other ways, it's a much richer sort of a theory. So uh, let me uh, talk about how we would prove this second theorem then, or the, this first theorem, theorem 0 0.2. Um, so really there are two stages here. We have a whole flag to work with. And uh, so the first thing we wanna do is somehow optimize the surface by isotopy with respect to the even contact structure. And here we don't need to mention the angle structure at all. We can play the same game in an arbitrary even contact manifold. And then of course, the second step, we need to bring in the uh, two plane field D and try to deal with that. But as far as um, dealing with the, the uh, even contact structure, well, the first observation is that um, we can assume the surface is generic and then it, it turns out it has finitely many W tangencies and we can cancel these in pairs if and only if the normal Euler class is zero. So that is, uh, uh, well, really, if you look at it closely, somehow it's equivalent to, uh, to uh, taking a section of the normal bundle and, and uh, getting rid of all its zeros. So uh, th that's a pretty straightforward step. Uh, but it's also an important step because once we get rid of all the W tangencies, well, throughout the rest of the proof, we're going to assume that condition. And once we have no W tangencies, we can thicken our surface in the normal direction. And that will uh, give us a three manifold in there. And the whole three manifold will be transverse to W. And as we've already seen, that three manifold will canonically inherit a contact structure. So what that means is that uh, we're now essentially talking about a surface and a contact manifold. And so we can apply all that well-developed theory to try to understand our new situation. So for example, uh, we can call it the surface convex if it's convex in this contact three manifold, and that will be independent of how we've chosen to, to uh, push off. And uh, once we know what convexity is, well, we can talk about dividing sets in the same way. That's all well-defined just in the four manifold because anytime we wanna know what it means, we just push off some transverse three manifold and then we can see. And uh, another uh, case of that is that we wanna be able to talk about the characteristic foliation, which in the context setting is determined by 
how the contact planes are hitting the surface. Uh, but the, the contact planes are hitting the surface exactly the way the even contact structure is, because the only difference between those two things is that E extends in the other direction of W, which is transverse to our three manifold. So I will talk about characteristic foliations without distinguishing which of the two settings we're in, because it doesn't matter. All right. So now we are, we can bring to bear the full power of convex surface theory in contact topology. And what is the most powerful tool in convex surface theory? Well, I would say, arguably, it is Honda's uh, bypass operation. So what we want to do is to simplify the characteristic foliation using bypasses. And now, of course, bypasses are a very powerful thing in contact topology, but in order to be able to use them, you first have to be able to find the bypass half disk. And uh, that, of course, is, can be a difficult question in contact three manifolds. So if you're used to dealing with that sort of problem, then maybe it's very surprising that, in fact, in an even contact manifold, bypass half disks always exist. So that whole problem doesn't exist in dimension four, which makes life much simpler somehow. So uh, I, that's maybe such a surprising thing that I owe you a, a quick proof of that. And so I will start out with a front projection of the, uh, the, the bypass disk we want to look at. And uh, well, I was asked to do this lecture on Valentine's Day. So uh, there's our front projection. And uh, all right, so what is this? Well, every, by, to, to do a bypass in a contact three manifold, we need a bypass arc in our surface in our contact three manifold. And that always can be given by a local model. And so the local model I want to use is, uh, let's bring that back. The local model I want to use is, uh, I'm going to take R3 with its standard height contact structure, but I will represent it by this form that rotates more than our usual standard contact form. Uh, so we, we still have a front projection, but it, it there's more rotation involved. It, if you like the... Uh, the standard contact structure on the three torus, this is its universal cover. And inside of there, we want to look at the xy plane, which of course is projecting the y axis. That's our model for the surface. And our uh, bypass arc then will be the interval from negative pi to pi on the x axis, which is then projecting to this down, down to the origin. So the uh, Let's see. All right. So then, well, to um, elaborate on that, uh, this xy plane is is convex with respect to the unit vector field in the z direction. Where did my cursor go? There's my cursor. All right. And uh, then the dividing set, it's easy to check, is just x equals n pi, so a bunch of lines parallel to the, to the y-axis. And that dividing set hits C in exactly three points, namely the two endpoints in the origin. So this, in fact, is exactly the right thing to be a model for a bypass arc. And so now let's look at this smoothly embedded Legendrian arc, whose image is this uh, Valentine thing. Um, that is, uh, well, first of all, we notice one endpoint is at x equals pi, pi here, and we sweep around, and if you think about it carefully, it ends up at negative pi. So in fact, this arc L has the same endpoints as C, and so then there's an obvious half disk in there bounded by C and L, and uh, I don't actually want it to be the uh, valentine that we see here. I want it to be, well, let me trace it out. We'll start with, with the uh, arc C in the, in the, on the x-axis, and we'll drag this arc C upward a little. So now it's here in the picture. 
gets up to here and then the front projection is gonna be folded on itself in three dimensions. What's gonna happen is we curl around behind everything and come down here. So think about that curled over disc as being the half disc we wanna have. And uh, it's straightforward to check that uh, TB of the disc is uh, negative one, which is what we need for a bypass disc. Uh, if you think about it carefully, uh, if you want to push off a parallel uh, copy using the contact framing, well, it turns out these two twists, these two cusps basically cancel each other out. But then there's a full twist coming from this full twist in the contact structure. So, in fact, that is almost the bypass disc. Uh, what are we seeing here? Well, again, the, the surface we want to attach it to is this is the XY plane. So near the XY plane, it looks exactly like it's supposed to. It's attached to half of its boundary. And uh, it's coming up here. And it, it's bounded by something with TB equal to negative 1. So that's all good. But then the only problem is we come around here and we come crashing through the surface where we don't want to. And so if we're doing contact topology, then uh, if we're doing contact topology, then this whole construction is kind of useless because, because we have this collision that we aren't allowed to have and that just messes everything up. But we are not doing contact three manifold topology. We're doing angle four manifold topology. So there's in fact one more coordinate here that we don't see in the three-dimensional picture and what I can do is eliminate that extra intersection by perturbing in that fourth direction. That is, I keep the picture exactly the same as it is up to around where the fold is, and then we start pushing the disk just a little bit in that fourth direction so that that eliminates the intersection. Well, now we're no longer in our three manifold N anymore, which might seem to be a problem, but that doesn't matter because remember, we're really working in this angle manifold. And what we have now is an embedded two complex that where we have this plane and we have uh, a disk attached along half its boundary uh, that's disjointly embedded in the four manifold. Those are or that's embedded in the four manifold with only the intersection we want to see. And so what we can do is take that whole two complex and thicken it transversely to W, and that gives us a new three manifold with an inherited contact structure. Uh, that three manifold, well, we can see it in this picture. It maps locally contact amorphically down onto our original picture, except that it's two to one near where the intersection appears to be occurring. So, uh, so we've eliminated the intersection by creating a new contact three manifold. And in that new contact three manifold, we can still do the bypass operation and get a new convex surface that's convex with respect to a new N, but remember we don't really care which N we're using, so that's okay. So then in any angle manifold, we can do bypasses anywhere we want to do them. Uh, so in some sense, this is a very different operation from uh, the usual three-dimensional operation. So maybe we should uh, we should distinguish this from the usual operation by calling it a coronary bypass. But uh, anyway, <laughs> we, uh, so we now have this very powerful tool that we can use anywhere we want to use it. And so at that point, uh, the rest of our, our uh, well, we can easily clean up the uh, uh, intersection with E just the way we it is easily, uh, we can make it be just about anything we want. What we want to do is to make the foliation transverse to the second factor. So uh, there is the uh, schematic picture. Uh, we take any decomposition as S1 across S1, and we can make the foliation transverse to to the vertical direction with respect to that uh, coordinatization. So one way to do that, well, we can just uh, uh, 
do bypasses everywhere we want until we've simplified the dividing set down to just a parallel pair of essential circles going around this way. And then we hit it with the flexibility theorem and then we can make our, our, uh, our um, uh, we can make our foliation nice and simple. So that's what I meant by optimizing with respect to E. And uh, so now, uh, one thing we observe is that because we've gotten rid of any possible uh, singularities in the vibration, then automatically we've, we've rigged this thing to be transverse to E. But now we remember that we're no longer, we, we well, it's fine to work in even contact four manifolds. We've got a nice theorem there, but really we want to work in angle manifolds. And this thing is still not transverse to the angle structure. And that is basically, uh, well, what does the angle structure look like here? What do the angle planes look like? Well, in our contact manifold, they look like a line field in C, as we've already discussed. And that line field, we haven't said anything about at all. We can wiggle just a little bit in the W direction to make it generic. But then the uh, L is tangent to sigma along some complicated one manifold. And uh, well, we don't know anything else at this point. So the next thing we need to do is somehow control that one manifold. And at this point, what we do, what we want to do is, well, we don't have room to move very much in the W direction. So really all of our movement has to be the, uh, or just nearly all of our movement has to be of the torus in, inside of the three manifold. We can stick out a little, just a little bit if we want to, but uh, uh, mostly we're moving around inside this three manifold. And what we want to do is change how L interacts with the tangent spaces, the tangent planes by twisting the tangent planes. So with a C0 small with C1 large isotopy of the surface. And in particular, what we want to do is we find arcs and circles that are transverse to C, and then we have a local model we can use for twisting and simplifying this intersection. And then the conclusion is that uh, uh, we can actually simplify until uh, well, the simple picture I want to see is what I've actually drawn here. We can arrange the line field so that it's only parallel to sigma along a bunch of parallel circles transverse to the foliation. That's these red circles I've drawn. And uh, so uh, skipping over all that work, we end up in this position. And uh, uh, so what is does that actually mean? The uh, well, uh, the leaves are now going to be uh, are going to be a transverse to to L in between these, and hence transverse to D in between these red arcs, and so. Well, what we can do at this point is look at a local model of one of these annuli. And uh, in that local model, well, now we can look, we can, we can take the Z coordinate to be just along these arcs, and then we can drop the Z coordinate and look in WXY, WXY space parameterized by this whole circle, the, the Z coordinate. And what we get is a one parameter family of arcs that are transverse to the other contact form beta that I talked about in WXY space. And so now we have standard theory that says the transverse arc can be made Legendrian by, uh, by putting a bunch of wiggles in. And so then what we can do is make all these things Legendrian. So really what it comes down to what this end game is, is that if we think about how to make an arbitrary knot in a contact three manifold transverse, well, first we want to make it Legendrian, that is transverse to, to the planes everywhere. We know it's transverse at isolated points. So then by putting in a little wiggles, we can make it Legendrian everywhere. 
And once it's Legendre and there's this transverse push-off operation, it makes it transverse. And what I want to claim is that uh, modulo technical details that we need to sort through. The, the idea is that uh, we just do a, a version of that parametrized by a circle, and that actually makes the trend makes the torus Legendrian in a suitable sense, and then we can do a push off to make it transverse, and that completes the proof. So uh, let me then take the last few minutes. Do I have until uh, 12, uh, 12 30 or so to do this? Or let me let me take the last few minutes. Yes, you do. To, okay, let me take the last few minutes to uh, talk about. If I can find where my cursor went, yeah, there it is. Uh, let's come back to uh, there. We are. Come back to to the other theorem, the uh, how we distinguish transverse tori that are isotopic to each other. And uh, uh, well, in a way, that's that's uh, simpler in spirit. Uh, so. Uh, the way we distinguish transverse knots is with the self-linking numbers. So we want to play a similar game in angle manifolds. What we want to do is, is figure out what the formal invariants are for uh, oh, there we go. We, we, uh, I, that's just what I said. What we want to do is, uh, is work out the formal invariants of transverse tori in a contact manifold. And it turns out it turns out that uh, there's more going on there than in the contact case. There are, in fact, two invariants that are both cohomology classes on sigma. Those are the primary invariants. And there's also a pair of integer secondary invariants, which I'm not going to talk about because I know very little about them, but they exist. Um, so let me focus on these primary invariants. What are they? Well, what we want to do Remember that I, I said earlier that whenever we have a, a transverse surface, the angle structure trivializes both the tangent bundle and the normal bundle. So if I somehow topologically specify trivializations for those bundles, then I can compare the angle trivializations to those topological trivializations, and that will give us obstructions. Well, they will essentially be maps of the torus into the circle, which is one-dimensional cohomology classes, which is uh, what I claim we're getting here. So there's one of these for the tangent bundle and one of these for the normal bundle. So to talk about the tangent bundle first, which is uh, easiest to define, we notice that the torus always has a canonical trivialization of its tangent bundle, just because it's R2 mod Z2 or S1 cross S1. And uh, it turns out that any way you identify it, you're always going to get the same trivialization up to homotopy. So we've got this canonical topological trivialization, and then we compare the angle trivialization to it. And uh, that gives us this invariant that can actually be read fairly easily off the characteristic foliation. It, it comes down to basically counting rabe components of your characteristic foliation. Now, the... Uh, Downside of this is that it's kind of hard to find examples that are not zero. Uh, in fact, if we look at uh, our, all the ones we constructed already, those have a very simple foliation on. That's so simple that automatically the uh, delta t is going to turn out to be zero. And uh, if you try to put rib components in this, it's going to screw up the proof pretty badly. I don't know how to deal with that. So everything that comes out of this theorem automatically has delta t equal to zero. But, uh, oh, and uh, there is a related question that in the prolongation of the standard tight R3, I don't know whether it's possible to find an unknotted transverse torus where delta t is not zero. So in some sense, this is hard to work with, but it turns out that there are a lot of prolongations on which uh, you can fairly easily construct examples with non-zero delta t. Usually they're generally, by construction, they tend to be prolongations of over-twisted contact manifolds, which is why we can't do this with the standard tight R3. But um, 
yeah, at least we can find uh, examples and prolongations, which is heading toward uh, the the uh, the new part of, the, of part B of the theorem here. And the other thing we need to observe is that in fact, delta T is invariant, not just under regular homotopy, but under a transverse regular homotopy, but under transverse, sorry, it's invariant, not just under transverse isotopy, but under transverse regular homotopy. And uh, well, that's just because whenever we do a regular homotopy, it's gonna drag along the uh, canonical trivialization. And if it's transverse, it's gonna drag along the, uh, the angle trivialization, and so the invariant won't change. So that's really what's going on in B, that it, in the right sorts of prolongations, we can actually distinguish transverse regular homotopy classes with delta T. So now what about the other stuff, distinguishing transverse isotopy classes within a transverse uh, regular homotopy class, or at least when delta T is zero in, in part A? How do we do that? Well, that's our other invariant delta nu, and that's the one that's really the strict analog of, uh, of the, the self-linking number of a transverse knot in a contact three manifold. So, uh, so that's again analogous to the self-linking number. I should add that uh, uh, a recent paper independently by Kegel actually used uh, well, a different uh, description of this invariant really in, a, in sort of a, a more special case. He used it to construct the first examples of families of transverse tori that are isotopic, but not transverse isotopic. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cite him for, for that. But what we're aiming to do here is something much more general. For example, we wanna, we wanna just do this for uh, any torus at all made transverse. And um, so I, I think that works more easily from the point of view I've described here of, of uh, thinking of it as a formal invariant, uh, comparing the angle trivialization with some topological trivialization. And how do we get that topological trivialization? Well, just like for transverse knots in, in contact free manifolds, what we need is a ciphered solid. And that ciphered solid will hand us a topologically defined normal trivialization. And so then we can use that, um, that normal framing to compare the angle framing against, and that's how we get a rather invariant, and that's the basic idea for proving the rest of the theorem. Uh, the big question here is, under what conditions is that framing really canonical? I mean, if we choose a different ciphered solid, sometimes at least we get a different normal framing. So one has to work through that carefully. And it turns out that under a lot of hypotheses, for example, if the, um, if the torus is embedded trivially in rational one homology, then automatically the uh, framing that arises is canonical. And then we really do get delta nu as uh, a class in H upper one, that is as something that evaluates on H lower one of the torus. But uh, there are cases where the framing is not canonical, but in that case, what happens is that there is always a canonical direct sum end on which the framing is well-defined. And so in that case, what really happens is the delta nu is not defined on all of your one homology, but it's defined on a canonical one-dimensional sum end. And uh, so then that's still enough to get infinitely many values. So in either case, we can uh, we get enough power out of this thing to prove all of the rest of theorem three. So uh, I guess I will, well, that is the uh, end. I will uh, stop there. Okay, I think we can thank Bob. Uh, are there any questions? So, um, hi, Bob. Um, hi. 
uh, just uh, the the invariant you're using, the sort of linking invariant, um, is sounds a, a lot like the um, invariant that Fintischel and Stern used when they were looking at sort of I forgot exotic exotic Lagrangians. I think it was. Or, um, is well, that is that is that essentially the same? Is it the same thing, or is it or maybe they're not really the same? It, that was, of course, in symplectic manifolds. Um, well, okay, if you're in, if you have a Lagrangian torus in a symplectic manifold, there the symplectic structure is going to hand you a canonical trivialization. Right, but then, but in, I've forgotten exactly how the how their thing worked, but somehow they they did something that seemed. It, it's been a while, so uh, I've sort of forgotten exactly how it. How it uh, how it works, but it seems like it's it's very similar in spirit. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. It's not probably not. I mean, there's only so many things you can do with yeah, yeah framing to a like, torus. But... Yeah, yeah, it seems like you would need some sort of topologically defined trivialization, and a ciphered solid would be a natural thing yeah. to do. Or if yeah, you I have think... some kind of vibration, like a like an elliptic vibration, that would be natural, I guess. For for uh, for something like the Fintischel Stern construction, they 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 choose a framing in order to make that work. So I don't remember exactly what you're referring to. Yeah, but... yeah. Anyway, you, you might just poke around in their in their paper. Just I don't know. Okay. Just, so that, that it, was... it, it seems it feels like a sim. There's something or other about uh, non-isotopic Lagrangians, and they distinguish them by. Uh, uh -huh. Oh yeah, you can by you some kind of thing like that. Yeah, yeah. If you had. To Lagrangian Torah, you could compare them the same way by comparing the the canonical normal trivialization. So yeah, that's probably what they did. It's uh, in a way somehow the obvious thing to do. It's just uh, getting it to all, getting it to all work out. I mean, we we basically knew at the the AIM conference in twenty seventeen that that uh, uh, that there were these canonical trivializations that ought to be useful, and so somehow that was telling you yeah, about. So, so it's the realization that's the that's the tricky. Yeah, part. yeah. Well, really, the, the way I got started here was proving existence, and then once you prove existence, well, what can you do with it? Well, that's sort of the obvious game to play, and so I just pushed it as far as I could. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm not claiming that that the existence of these normal trivializations is is is. Uh, is new that's probably gone back i mean yeah yeah certainly that was well known anyway I, I just want it's it's more just to point it out that that's yeah that there, yeah. there was this sort of yeah. other it, similar yeah. use, use of a similar yeah. idea um, yeah I, I guess that's that's good to know and I, i'm not surprised that it's been thought of before certainly there have yeah. been a lot of applications of of uh torah and four manifolds and various people have studied that you think say about the normal directions and so it may, yeah, it may be that the last line here is in somebody's paper somewhere, but I worked it out so that I could do what I needed to do here. Yeah, anything else? Or... Sorry, I'm working with the control. It's not sounding like other people are. I think we can thank you again. If you're willing to send me a PDF of your notes, I will post it along with the video. So thanks, Bob. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Uh, uh, can you can you send me the URL or is it easy to find? I, I have a student who oh, might be interested. For the video? Yeah, yeah. I'll send you uh I'll send that presently so you can see where all of our lectures are. Okay. Oh great. Yeah, and I, I'll forward it to my student and yeah, right. but the video will take me a while to process. It might not be up until tomorrow afternoon. But right. okay. Well, just let me know when it's there. I'm sure he's not in a in a hurry to see it. That yeah, he'll want to see it eventually. Awesome. In that case, I will probably say goodbye to everybody and log okay. off. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bob.